Just touched down in Denver Airport, getting ready to Denver. get on a different airplane to Bozeman, Montana. How are you feeling, Steve? I mean, I'm talking to my fake microphone. Oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm not are you tired. excited? I am. I'm excited to hit the uh, ground and uh, hit the ground running. I'm pumped up to see, get feet on the land and kind of smell and get small the sage and pine needles. He slept most of the way here, and I got a, I got a really good picture of him sleeping. I'll, I'll be course. sure to insert that right here. So we landed in Bozeman, Montana Airport at around 1, 1.15. We picked up a rental car and then headed on 84 to Norris and then took 287 down through Ennis and down through the Madison Valley there. And we did stop at a rest stop um, off of 287 before heading to our blaze site insert pictures here if you haven't been to montana or if you haven't been to that area that drive from bozeman down through the madison valley was or the madison flats whatever they call it was absolutely amazingly beautiful um big open spaces rolling hills um you know i, I believe we went drove through like beartooth canyon or around that area there was it was just it was so gorgeous and um, very limited cell phone reception, which is something to note. Um, if you want to use your GPS, you definitely got to punch it in while you're still in a populated area because um, there's a lot of no cell phone areas. So just be prepared for that. Once we got done at the rest stop, we did head to um, our blaze. I love doing that. Um, and on the way there, we did see a geological um, marker kind of uh, one of those like little stops where information signs so we stopped and just took a picture I had already seen the, that picture online so we didn't stay there too long um, but it's just a, a reminder that we are heading into an area that did get impacted pretty heavily by an earthquake in 1959 so to stay aware to stay alert and have a backup plan no matter where you go and what you do so from there we pulled up and saw our blaze And this is where I felt um, first time searcher syndrome, okay? Um, I did a lot of videos before we went on this search and I hid my search location. I didn't really discuss it with anybody. Um, maybe talk to Joel Wiki and Charles Chapman and maybe Terry and um, Troy Barlow maybe a little bit, a little bit in maybe the messages and stuff, but didn't really give too much away about where I was looking or I was thinking. Um, because I wanted to protect myself because I had that first time searcher syndrome where you think, oh, nobody's ever thought of this before and I know exactly where the treasure is. And then you get to your spot. And first, the size of the location blows your mind. All right. I knew this area from maps. I knew it from satellite footage. I knew it front back. I knew all the roads around it. I knew it. What I didn't know was how steep exactly some of those hills were. I knew from Google Earth that some of them were pretty steep, but when you're actually there and you're actually thinking about a 79 or 80 year old man trying to go up and down certain things and you realize that that's probably not a possibility anymore. Um, you're looking at all different kind of things. You're looking at tree growth, um, especially in the area I was searching. You know, a lot of the trees that were there now probably weren't there when Forrest went and hid the treasure. So it you go through this phase, this thing where you're like, all right, well, I, I still think I know, but and I'll adapt. And I did. We, we drove through it. We stopped. We looked. Amazing overviews. Absolutely gorgeous. But you definitely go through a process where you're trying to relate all the information and knowledge you currently have with what is visually and physically right before your eyes. You have to be adaptive because this hunt requires adaption. So um, the first thing we did, like I said, was we scouted out the area. Um, we walked along the north edge of the Madison River just to kind of get a feel. My search area was actually targeted on the south side of the Madison, which required some 
maneuvering in order to actually get to. So I wanted to check out the scenery and figure out the scope of things first. From there, we drove around the backside because I thought there was a local access road to get to my search area. And when we got back there, there was a fence around my um, local access road. It was no longer accessible. So it definitely changed things. So we had to come back out of that area and we had to regroup. Um, what else could Forest have meant by when you see the blaze look quickly down? Of course, my blaze was the Madison slide. So we thought, okay, well, if you're following the poem, you're coming from Hebgen Lake and as, maybe as soon as you see the blaze, you look quickly down. So um, we kind of set up our rest of our week on where we should search. Um, and we started searching um, kind of any area with trees. We looked for down logs because, again, that phrase, brave and in the wood. So I definitely kind of focused on the wood aspect. Where were there logs? Where was there wood? And um, kind of just, we kind of just did a lot of, of research that first day um, and a little bit of exploring. Um, we did get the metal detector out and on the north side of the Madison, west of the slide air, immediately west of the slide area, we went up this ramp. It's It looks like it might have been part of the old road and is now used for upkeep on electrical, like poles and wires and things like that. Um, but up there we found a lot of really cool interesting things. A lot of cool interesting things. We found things like bones. Lots of bones. Um, my man went a little bit farther and found a whole lot of fur and what looked to be like a beaver pelt up on this side of the hill. Um, and it was just in insane. Um, it was definitely had a lot of fenny aspects to it. However, it looked like it was very populated. Every time we drove by that area, not only that day, but also the rest of the week, there were constantly cars there, parked there. Um, it kind of looked like somebody was actually using it as a bathroom break area one time when we stopped there. So I don't know if the treasure would be in that location. Um, we did go back and investigate it a second time later in the week. But one of the really cool things in there is when you do go up the ramp um, farther west, there is a beautiful overlook where you can see the slide area. You see the Madison River flowing. You see like the valley, the flats, the Continental Divide area, um, like Reynolds Pass, all that stuff. And it is just the most beautiful place in the world. Um, right now, I still, like to me, it was just the most beautiful place in the world. So if I was to die, I would not mind dying there and just looking out there. And I... And that's one of the reasons why I came back, you know, um, I think it was the Friday before we left. We did a second search of that area just because it was the most beautiful place. It had everything, the mountains, the flats, the river, like it was just, it was very awe-inspiring. The sun, the, you know, the sun, sunset over there, um, just the sun and the clouds, it was kind of in a very strange place where... Like when you're looking kind of north, like when you're on that ridge to like to your right to the north, the clouds were always a little bit thicker there and it was always a little bit clearer, a little bit south. And it looked like it was almost on this dividing line of where weather weather patterns kind of strike. So um, it definitely, you know, had a lot of massive just changes of, of scenery and and the pictures and the video I took, you'll see. It's It's a beautiful place. But something really cool happened um, when I was at the top enjoying my moment of solitude and peace away from cell phone reception and people and work. And, and while I was realizing that I probably was going to have a harder time finding Forrest's treasure than I originally thought my egotistical, confident self was going to have, um, my man was adamant on us going back to the car to get a monocle. Um, we had purchased a really nice quality monocle. Um, kind of like binoculars, but it's only one, um, from the car so we could come back up there and look. And he was so adamant and driving me crazy. And what I did find was on the way down, um, there was this Altoid tin in the middle of the path where we just came. And I didn't see it on the way up. I, I swear I didn't. 
And um, I had the metal detector and I don't know how I missed it. So he was like, did you drop that? And I'm like, I don't really like Altoids. And so I kicked it and I was like, oh, you know, maybe it's a geocache or something. Like maybe we should look inside. So when I opened it up, inside it was actually, it was gold. It was actually a piece of gold. It was his mother's ring and he dropped to one knee and he actually proposed to me. And I can't tell you how perfect that is because even though we went to Montana, walked over 30 miles, searched for Forrest Fenn's treasure, spent money on his trip that we could have spent on something else, um, I did come home with a treasure that I wasn't expecting. So I did come home with some gold. Uh, him, he got me. And a bunch of other parasites because apparently that area was really infested with ticks. So not only did he get one parasite, he, we ended up pulling like seven ticks off of him later that night. Um, also when we went back to revisit that area on Friday, we pulled another six ticks off of him. <laughs> the ticks seemed to really like him. So I would recommend if you're going out, um, some areas are going to have a lot more problems with ticks than others. Um, the people in West Yellowstone were saying how on the west side of the mountains, uh, the ticks were a lot more of a problem than on the east side. Um, I know that Rocky Mountain fever is a thing. I don't know how much of a thing, so just be careful. Um, he covered himself in um, bug spray after the first day and he still wound up with six ticks on him the last day. I think we pulled two or three off of me that last day. Somehow I didn't get any on the first day, but any area that is, has a lot of wild animals in it, um, tracing, tra trampsing, tracing through, um, you're going to have that problem. So just, just keep that in the back of your head, um, and be alert and conscious of it and make sure you check yourself. You know, when you take your clothes off in your hotel or your camper at night, um, double check them, turn them inside out. Ticks love dark, warm places. They love to get into your hair. Um, and they tend to go up. They tend to climb up your body. So, um, his shirts were probably the worst, you know, once we turned them inside out, we'd find them in all kinds of places on the shirts. So just a warning there. Um, big lessons that we learned the first day. <sighs> if you've never been boots on the ground, I got some bad news for you. Um, the reality of what you're going to face when you actually get out there is a whole lot different than what's in your mind. You may know exactly where that treasure is, and it still does not mean you're going to find it. I'm very, very, very sad to say that. Your solve can make all the sense in the world. It can match all nine clues in the poem. It can match things in the thrill of the chase. But the reality is, is wherever Fen hid this, we're all missing something. We're missing the exact location of this treasure. It's been out there for at least eight years. It could be covered by anything. It could be covered by grass. It could be covered by a rock slide. It could be covered by a beaver den. It could be covered just by pine needles and leaves and so many other things that you really have to go in with a completely different mentality. And you have to understand that it's going to take more than a good solve to find this treasure. So I admit I was overconfident. And, and I admit that, um, but I still walked away from this trip with an amazing, amazing treasure, a fiance, um, and memories and a peace inside of me that I didn't have before. So I can't wait to go back to Montana. I hope you enjoy the pictures and I can't wait to tell you about the rest of the week. So more to come. <laughs>